This is a video summary for the article entitled An Automated Open Source Workflow for Standards Compliant Integration of Small Animal Magnetic Resonance Imaging Data, which was published in February 2020 in Frontiers in Neuroinformatics. The chronologically first and perhaps most important concern regarding data handling is establishing a raw data recourse. The most obvious reason why raw data recourse might be relevant is, of course, that it increases processing transparency and reproducibility. Transparency meaning that one can see where exactly the data and therefore all of the analysis and the statements start from, and of course reproducibility because this process can be rerun and inspected when whether or not it works, and of course reused by other people who might want to derive the analysis workflow in order to enhance it, collaborate on it, or in fact quality check it. But beyond just that, having a raw data recourse adds to the quality of the data analysis is as well. It might seem strange simply because it's just a representation of data, but of course binding the analysis to the raw original form of the data prevents undocumented operator-induced fixes, most prominently in the field of preclinical and also clinical fMRI processing are ex post facto manipulations. These do not necessarily have to be malicious, but they could also simply include corrections made for known errors with the acquisition system or with the standard repositing given by the acquisition system. That doesn't mean that such uh, interventions should not be done, but ideally they should not be done manually. This, of course, enhances the reproducibility simply because the, anal the data form which is taken for analysis is not contingent on variable operator manipulations. But beyond just that, it also increases transparency simply because this is then a known factor which can be inspected for whether or not it was duly or correctly done. Another common intervention might be outlier filtering, which again, there's plenty of good reasons to do outlier filtering, though this should also be done explicitly in order to provide for a better quality analysis. Not least of all, having a raw data recourse will, will enable better data integration, meaning that if multi-center studies are to be conducted, or of course, if somewhere down the line, a meta-analysis is to be performed on this data, it is, of course, best to try to integrate the data so as to process it with a homogeneous workflow. This will decrease biases and variability resulting from different workflows, which of course is a huge problem with meta-analyses, which simply look at the end results of other studies rather than redoing the analysis work and integrating the data in its rawest form. Uh, which of course is a more difficult thing to do, but it is also a more worthwhile thing to do, for which having such a raw data recourse uh, will be a great advantage. Now, the way in which a raw data recourse and the fact, in fact, the entire workflow can be mapped is known as provenance. Provenance simply refers to the chronology of information processing, meaning that it is a chained, a directed graph of the forms which the data takes. And you can see that in this figure, it starts with an analog signal, which is then digitized by the scanner, recorded as time domain case space data, then reconstructed by the scanner in a volumetric format, which is proprietary because it is done by the scanner software on the acquisition system, which is proprietary. And then of course that can be transferred to an analysis system and an analysis pipeline, and then processed further downstream from that. Now, of course, the rawest data would always be the best possible recourse. However, the scope of what exactly the rawest data can feasibly be is limited by the scope of the researcher's work. Commonly in MRI and fMRI analysis, particularly for labs chiefly interested in biological applications, the reconstruction is not done explicitly via analysis software under the control of the user but the process used for that is the proprietary acquisition system workflow, whatever is given by the vendor. Therefore, for most of these formats, the standard raw data recourse would be not the time domain case space data, but the volumetric data. Of course, this could be extended in as far as that is required, but this is generally the common case. Now, what you will see in this figure are also these green nodes at the end, which high at the end at the bottom, which highlight all of the individual steps where data might need or where it might behoove the analysis or the process of research to share the data, either for collaboration in case the work is split in order to maximize specialization and expertise at the various steps, or of course also for uh, introspection or inspection by external uh, reviewers who might want to take a closer look at what is happening for quality control purposes and so on. Now, 
Whether or not this can be done is actually dependent on whether or not the format is understandable. If the format is understandable, then this can be done. If the format is not understandable, even though the data may be open, in practice it, uh, it may be unusable. Uh, vendor formats in particular, for instance Brooker Paravision, which is the predominant vendor in the preclinical MR field, are not good standards. That is because they are vendor specific and they are not accessible for editing by people who develop analysis workflows and who might need customizations and who might need specific features. This input is not available in the interaction with the vendor for good reasons perhaps, meaning that it is not a good universally understandable format. Other analysis toolkits or analysis toolkits in general, which might work a lot with human data, might have converged on another standard, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, which is of course different from this vendor standard. Therefore, the data needs to be converted for analysis to take place with reliable tools. Now, automatic conversion to a standard format, which is the red arrow in the middle of this graph, would allow a number of benefits. First of all, it would permit automatic creation of a standardized 3D raw data recourse. It would be raw simply because no processing has been done. It would, of course, not be the same as the volumetric reconstruction because something is changed about this data. But it would be raw in the sense that no large-scale interventions were performed on it. So. If this red arrow is available, then basically the step from whatever scanner format you get from your scanner to a shape of the data which you can either automatically analyze with community developed tools or share with others can be automatically done. This is not something which can, has to be manually finagled. And of course, this has a corollary benefit in that the volumetric reconstruction which is offered by the scanner, so the, the raw vendor format, therefore also becomes implicitly standardizable, meaning that you might not be able to work with it directly, but if the conversion from it to a format with which you can work directly can be done automatically, it is basically just as good as that. So a raw data recourse to this form is also possible. Therefore, both, both of these steps are actually enhanced. The right-hand step is easier to get, and the left-hand step is uh, implicitly equivalent or automatically convertible to the right-hand form of the data. Now we've talked a bit about formats, and we've established why vendor formats might be uh, a suboptimal solution. Uh, they are of course intransparent, sometimes they're not documented at all, otherwise they are documented, just not in a very easy to understand or perhaps not even publicly accessible fashion. And this is of course a consequence of the way in which they are developed. They are optimized in order to make uh, the work of the acquisition system easiest and in order to provide a large spectrum of absolutely everything anybody might need in any context in order to satisfy clients. Open standards, which are used for a lot of analysis work, which are developed free and open source, are by definition better documented simply because they live off of how many people can understand them and contribute to them. So an open standard will always have better documentation and will be better for inspection and for yeah, working with it and developing tools which can automatically handle it. Uh, there's also the, uh, the version of going with database formats. However, database formats are generally monolithic because that's the definition of a database. You basically have a large binary file which might contain, contain table structures inside. Uh, and they also often require complicated specialized technology simply because they are a binary file and they need a specific sort of software which can open them. BIDS, the brain imaging data structure, has, uh, is a newly emerging format which has seen increasing use, particularly in human MRI, but is also being introduced as we speak, including via this workflow to preclinical MRI. It builds on the widely used NIFTY standard, which has developed into a sort of de facto standard for all sorts of higher level MRI data processing pipelines. And the reason why it has done so is because it is very compact and it, uh, it actually supports arbitrary dimensionality. Now, in addition to that, of course, you might have uh, other fields which do not fit into this uh, nifty format, right? I talked about it being compact and of course a feature of that is that it does not allow so many other fields. Uh, these fields are generally called metadata fields and as you can see in the fi figure below, they are also included on the scanner. And of course, ideally, these could, uh, these could be automatically parsed as well and integrated into whatever format comes afterwards. Incidentally, BIDS has support for these metadata fields via sidecar files. So sidecar files are small files which, uh, which 
hang around with the, uh, with the original data file. And all of these metadata records are um, entered and recorded in human readable text. And this has the huge advantage that they are accessible to basic GNU utilities, which you will find on any Mac or any Linux distribution, such as diff, for instance, to compare versions. And this makes uh, interaction a lot easier. In addition to that, uh, BITS also contains a specification for the directory hierarchy. And the directory hierarchy is, of course, a very intuitive and ubiquitous mode of organization. You probably use it for almost everything on your computer, uh, meaning that whether you work with a GUI, so with a graphical user interface, or with a command line, this will be perfectly and accessible and intuitively accessible to you so that you can browse the data and make sense of it in your favorite interface. Now let's look at what the workflow actually does and how it handles this job of automatically converting the vendor broker standard to the bids open standard. Here you can see a graph representation of uh, the workflow and all of the inputs and the outputs which it gets. And of course, you also see a representation of the broker and the bids directory trees. So the broker paravision directory structure, as you can see demonstrated in these arrows on the left hand side of the screen is automatically resolved, meaning that all sorts of fields, uh, the workflow which we have developed, which is called brew to bids automatically knows how to interpret. So all of these individual components are redirected via this workflow in the specific places in which the bid standard specifies that they should be. And here you can see that something is fetched from the session, scan session name, which, uh, which in this case is the date. As you can see in the name, the date can be automatically parsed from it. In gray, you would see the actual data matrix from the 2D reconstruction that is parsed from one of these numbered directories these numbered subdirectories and of course all sorts of metadata fields are available in the scan program file and in the subject file and from there all of these uh, all of these fields get parsed into the bids format now here you can see underlined in corresponding um, colors what goes where and you can see that the core way in which uh, bids data sets are structured is that at the top level you have a directory for the subjects Underneath that, you have a directory for the sessions. Underneath that, you have subdirectories for the data types, as they are called. And inside of that, you have files which are named unambiguously, containing both the aforementioned subject and session fields, and also other fields such as acquisition, which is the acquisition protocol, and the uh, task, in case a task was presented to the animal, and uh, bold or CBV or T2W, which is T2-weighted, uh, which is, of course, the contrast. Here you also see one file which is called events. This is a stimulation protocol file, which brew to bits can also parse, although it is not part of the, um, of the core broker vendor format. Uh, meaning that it will also not complain if it's missing in case there are there is no stimulated data to parse. The function interface, so in order to use this block, which we have looked at previously, is available in two languages, either Bash or Python. Both of these interfaces are made available synchronously via the ARG, that's A-R-G-H, the ARG package, uh, which automatically creates command lines, so Bash bindings from Python functions. I can see here uh, they have a similar uh, parameter structure and they actually have a lot more parameters than you can see in this image. This just gives you like a minimal set for a basic selection. All of the other parameters which are not specified here can be not specified if you as the operator do not desire to specify them simply because they are um, they have general purpose defaults as inputted in the standard function definition. So what the parameter space does here is that it just allows you to select what kind of data types get matched to what kind of acquisition from the scans. Meaning that if you look on the previous slide, you will see that you have these data types anat and func, which are anatomical and functional. Ideally, you would be able to tell it what exactly to reposit into them. And this is what we're doing in this function call. The scan selection works via BIDS key value dictionary. So again, if you recall the previous slide, BIDS has these fields which are called SUB minus 5691. 
or ACQ minus turbo rare. The first is called the key and the second is called the value. And that's exactly what you do in these dictionaries via which you select which data should be reposited by specifying acquisition and then a list of the accepted values. Now, of course, you might be wondering how, how exactly do, do we make sure that these uh, strings match at all? So do, are there any requirements which are needed for this to work? And actually there aren't really any requirements other than filling out the broker interface data correctly and with a couple of syntax specifications. On the right hand side of the screen you will see the study registration window which pops up whenever you record something in broker paravision and here you have two dedicated fields the animal id and the study name. Uh, these should correspond to whatever identifier you would like to be the value for the subject key, so SUB, and in the study name, that would be the value which you would like to have for the session key, so SES. The only syntax constraint which one should keep in mind here is that in the bits format, both underscores and dashes, so minuses, have specific meanings. Therefore, these value fields for any of the keys should not contain these characters because then, of course, the file name could not be constructed as it should be. And that's the only constraint which, uh, which one should bear in mind for this part. Now the second part is of course entering all of the information which might be variable from scan to scan. And here you can see an example of a script which can be automatically parsed. And it basically looks like a fragment of the bids file names which you would like to have in the end. So in this case ACQ, that is the key for acquisition, minus SE EPI, that is the value for this key, so spin echo EPI, underscore, the separator, as in the bids file names, task, which is the key for the task, rest, which would be the value, apparently this was a resting state scan, and bold, which would be the contrast. And here you can see a generalized example of what you might want to put in. Now, of course, if you don't have a task, you don't need to put that in. For all of the other metadata fields, other than these variable fields, which uh, rely on the operator entering them, we can do that automatically, but that's because we do not have the operator variability. The only reason why, they are, why there are some constraints for these fields is that they are operator variable and we cannot know what they are going to be, therefore some rules need to be followed. For everything else, we know what they are going to be based on uh, what we know about the Brooker Paravision format, and therefore we can process them completely automatically. But wait, you say, I mean, this, uh, this is great, but what if I have lots of data which I would like to reposit and make usable and get standardized archives out of, which I haven't done all of this for, or what if I forget, or what if I make a mistake? Well, there's an easy solution for that. Thankfully, the Brooker Paravision format saves all of these values in text files, meaning that with some knowledge of what exactly these files mean and how they are structured, it is very easy to redress pre-existing data which was not acquired with metadata which is automatically interpretable. So here on the right hand side you see an example of how a scan program file could be corrected. In blue you just see the lines between which these edits happen. In red you see the lines which were removed and in green the lines which were added. This is called diff syntax. And here you can see that for E6, this would be the sixth scan, you can just take the original name reformat it so that it conforms with the syntax and then add the key identifiers in this case ACQ because that is the acquisition protocol and the contrast. Uh, the contrast can generally be inferred from the acquisition protocol though it is best to do it uh, explicitly. Like this is a list of best practices. The workflow can actually compensate for a number of errors though still they should not be encouraged. And the same thing for another scan here. This is a functional scan which also has a task field. On the right hand side you see the sub Subject file, which is the file in which the subject identifier and the session identifier are recorded. And here they are identified by the string which goes before them. So whatever comes after the subject ID line is, and is in between greater than and smaller than signs is the subject name. And the same thing for the session name. And that of course can be redressed to match the identifiers as you would like to have them throughout your study. And this can always be done retrospectively and it will be done without data loss simply because none of the rest of the metadata. So the flip angles and so on gets uh, gets edited. Okay, now let's see uh, how this works out. Uh, can we uh, can we actually do anything with it? So for testing, both for demonstration purposes and for the integration testing of the package, 
we have an example archive, which is called Samurai Bin Data. If you have a Linux distribution which has access to the Portage Package Manager, you can simply enable the science overlay and install it automatically with one line. If you do not, or if you use Mac, you can install it manually by downloading it. That would be the vget command, unarchiving it, and then moving it into the directory where we expect it to be. By the way, in the last code block, only the last of the lines actually needs to be executed as root. Okay, so let's see how this works out. We've downloaded this binary data archive for Samurai, the example data. And based on that, we would like to execute this function to get acquainted with it and to see in how far it can really reposit this more or less real live data. Here we deal with mouse data. Now, if you look at the command, which is in the upper right uh, hand panel, uh, you will notice that the only mention of mouse is under the minus O parameter. Minus O means output. So that will be the directory under which the output is stored. We do not actually explicitly specify the species anywhere here. It's just that from all of these scans, we select those which have an acquisition of EPI as functional data type scans and those which have an acquisition of TurboRare as structural data type scans. Incidentally, we know that these namings are only present there for mouse data. So this is how the disambiguation step happens here. So on the left hand side, you have the original archive, which was either downloaded or automatically or manually before. And you can see that it contains these uh, somewhat uh, strangely named with lots of underscores and with some numbers at the end scan directories from Brooker. And within these, you have the subdirectories where the um, reconstruction is located and the scan program and the subject files where a lot of the metadata is located. Uh, basically, the command in the upper right will select a subsection of the data in the left-hand panel, and it will create the bits archive in the lower right-hand panel. And here you can see the typical bit structure, which we've also looked at before. At, one, at the first level, here you have this bits directory, which holds all of the bits data. At the subdirectory level underneath that, you have a directory named after the animal, which was identified by these scan names. Then you have the session, which was specified inside of the files of this animal. And then of course you have the anatomical and the functional data named correspondingly with the bid standard and automatically interpretable downstream by the multitude of tools which use the bid standard. Now moving forward, the same thing can be done for red data. Here you can see that although we specify minus F acquisition S EPI, so single echo EPI, it actually selects lots of files simply because very many files were acquired for this animal in this session with a spin echo EPI. And the way in which these are differentiated is by the run number. So it's not very many, it's two, but they come with the associated sidecar file, which I've mentioned earlier. That's this JSON file, which contains all sorts of other attributes, such as the flip angle and so on, automatically parsed from the Brooker data structure and also the events file for stimulation. And of course, it works just like that for lemur data, the species doesn't really matter at this point because it is truly just a data repositing step. So it's the same data in a different view which conforms with an open standard that's accessible to all sorts of tools. Now the technologies which are used in designing this workflow are exclusively free and open source. The workflow itself is distributed via the Samurai package and in the Samurai package, which stands for Small Animal Magnetic Resonance Imaging, uh, we have embedded all of the knowledge needed to parse the, the Brooker Paravision format in order to extract metadata steps. So that's all distributed in the same high level package. By the way, this package also comes with lots of analysis functions, but they don't need to be used. It can be used just for this one repositing technology. The stimulation protocol file integration, which I talked about previously, so this that events file, which is present whenever uh, stimulation files were recorded on the scanner while stimulation was performed, are based on a technology called Cosplay that is basically an external device which can be connected to the scanner and which will deliver stimulation and automatically record the protocol of that file in the relevant directory so that it can be integrated with the data downstream. Now, of course, you might be doing resting state or you might have your own more manual version of uh, stimulation file parsing. But again, this does have the advantage of being fully automatic and not operator error prone. Now the 2D sec conversion to Nifty 
is based on brew2nii. This is a function which can convert the 2D sec format to nifty. So this is nothing re-implemented here. This is just the functionality available in the free and open source framework, which is integrated with all of the metadata parsing. Incidentally, this function is a bit older and in the future it will be replaced with Brooker to nifty, which is the follow-up function. Though from the interface, nothing will change. That's just uh, underneath the hood in order to make sure that all features will be well supported in the future. Uh, data tracking for indexing all of these fields is performed in Pandas, a very prominent package in the Python environment, originally for econometrics, but now used by all sorts of research fields. And the workflow management is done via NiPipe, which is a neuroimaging pipelining package which can control, which can construct and control workflows. Now, speaking of which, the workflow structure looks the following. So in the way in which these workflows get executed is that for each data type, be it structural or functional, you have a different blueprint of the workflow simply because the things which you might need to do differ. And there's again yet another one for diffusion weighted imaging. And these get iteratively executed for all of the matches which are found. Uh, this has the advantage that if anything breaks, only that thing breaks, meaning that you still do get notified. So this is not about passing errors quietly, but that doesn't break the entire workflow, meaning that if one scan is not working, that's the scan that's not going to be working and everything else will be there for you to peruse and just to fix that one error at the end, not to repeat everything for the sake of one error. Okay, so what? What does this actually mean for your research? What does this actually empower you to do and how far is this something that's useful? Well, the core point is that you can now easily produce standardized bits archives, easily and automatically. And such archives are very useful, first of all, starting with just you for manual inspection. The structure is a lot clearer. It's organized by the fields which you care about, which are what animal is this, what session is this? What scan exactly is this? Can I double click and see the parameters really quick in one file? All of this is aided by having such an archive and now you can get it automatically. It's also very useful for distribution simply because you can upload it and you can actually have people download your data collection and understand what's going on inside there. You can finally have true open data and not open data where you upload your archive knowing possibly full well that nobody except you will ever be able to make sense of it. And in line with that, you also make your data more accessible for collaboration, meaning that if you are somebody who produces, who primarily produces data, but is perhaps not an expert in analysis, you can get expert insight and expert help for your data processing, simply because people who deal more with software and data analysis will be able to understand what exactly you did better. And this will, of course, make your research better. You can also archive Brooker Paravision data as your ultimate recourse, right? So we talked about data provenance at the beginning, the earlier, the better. And of course, the conversion step, amazing though it may be, every conversion step, since no two standards map perfectly onto each other, can introduce some deviations. And uh, ideally, you would take the data, which is as raw as possible, and use that as your recourse. Now, if the way in which you get from your Brooker Paraversion data to some sort of standardized format is manual, then you cannot, simply because then whatever you produced, in order to produce it again, you'll probably have to invest another couple of days. Whereas now, you can simply count on the fact that your Brooker Paravision data is automatically convertible into the standardized format and it's automatically usable as needed by downstream processing. And what this actually means for your analysis workflow is that you can chain all of the steps of your analysis as seen in the provenance figure in order to start with a reposting workflow, continue with the preprocessing, continue with the statistical analysis, finish with the plotting. Everything can be chained in one single compound workflow in which everything can be re-executed at once. This can help you immensely in making sure that your data analysis results can be reproduced from scratch. Imagine if you could always count on the fact that right before you finish an article and you submit it, you can fully delete everything you've done except the very raw data and your analysis scripts rerun the analysis scripts and check whether or not that's exactly what you get again. This is a very powerful tool, very helpful for reproducible science, something which many people possibly assume is being done, but which the infrastructure, sadly, before the availability of such tools, did not make possible. 
but now this can be made possible. Uh, so that's about it. These are the references and thank you for listening.